Good day. A very, very good evening and welcome to the second, and I must say, unfortunately, the last edition oh. of Hearts Buzz. And welcome not just to our audience here, beautiful audience it is, but also to those all around the world watching this via the internet. As veterans of our first presentation will know, the, we aim to report the news from this World Congress, Congress in beautiful Melbourne, Australia, to the global HD community in the spirit of what we believe is the dawning of a new age of communication between all members of the Huntington's disease community around the world. As Adlai Stevenson said, on this shrunken globe, men can no longer live as strangers. And two men who should no longer be strangers to you now are my co-presenters. Some say that when he was a soldier in Kosovo, he was so handsome that wives of the fighters on both sides <laughs> persuaded their husbands to lay down their arms and just look at him. <laughs> But to us, he's the pin-up in the white coat from Boston, USA, Dr. Jeff Carroll. seem to melt <laughs> nearly in the presence of his gaze but we know him as the man every woman loves for his intellect charm, <laughs> and humor what a waste <laughs> 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 Charles, before we head across to the sensuous realm of Chaplandia, 
formerly known as the Republic of Chatalonia and the fabled lost city of Chatlantis. It's uh, back to you. <laughs> so, as my um, considerably smarter, younger, and slimmer friends adjourn to Chatlandia, I will uh, quickly remind everyone of the rules. Any technical nonsense, the uh, guest will hear the bell, get through without it, and a Nobel Prize, which is what every researcher covers more than anything in the world. <coughs> An HD Buzz post it pack. <laughs> so, to our first guest tonight, Rachel Scarhell is a uh, senior research fellow at one of the great academic institutions of my hometown, University College London. She is at the Institute of Neurology there, working with Professor Sarah Tabrizi on the track HD study. Specifically, Rachel works on advanced MRI imaging techniques, all of which means that she's had the pretty scary experience of looking inside my head. While she was at school, Rachel apparently knitted a working model of the human digestive tract, <laughs> which is still on display at the school. So, didn't get out much then, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Rachel Scargill. Rachel, welcome. Thank you very much. You know the routine, kick back, relax, do what you have to do. <laughs> so we're talking about MRI scanning, uh, and I think it's best if I explain what an MRI scan is. As I understand it, having some experience in the area, an MRI scan is a giant magnet which extracts a person's soul and uses it to uh, construct images of their brain, hence the phrase magnetic personality. It's, it's it, something like Is that, that correct? It's along those lines. Now, with my hand hovering over the Nobel bell, broadly speaking, how does an MRI scanner actually make a photo of someone's brain? Okay, well, it picks up signal from the tissue within um, the brain and uh, measures different properties of the water molecules in the brain. So, different tissues appear different. Grey, quite conveniently, appears grey, and white, quite conveniently, appears white. And they just, they just give off different signals that the magnet can pick up, and we reconstruct that 3D image. And as time has gone on, the scanners have got better and more accurate? Absolutely, we can get better, clearer pictures, and uh, the three Tesla scans that we... <laughs> so they, uh... <laughs> I should have known, I should have known. Um, yes, the latest high-field strength magnets, the strong. big, big, strong magnets, give us much bigger, Excellent. better, clearer pictures. So here's the thing, we have a genetic test for Huntington's disease, and when someone has symptoms, we can see how bad their symptoms are. So why do we need to scan their brains? Okay, it's a very good question, because lots of people don't <laughs> like going in the scanner, um, but we really gain such valuable information from these lovely 3D pictures of the brain. Um, so we know that um, there are changes in the brain associated with the disease, but we, people who have a positive genetic test who aren't showing any symptoms of the disease at all, if we scan them many years before the expected onset, we can pick up subtle brain changes, changes and that gives us very valuable information. We learn to understand the disease process and how that changes over time. And so the next step would then be to when we want to test a drug would be to use the scans and the changes in the scan to help us to figure out if the drug is working. Absolutely. Once we get a clear picture of the natural course of the disease, we can then see whether a treatment has any effect on that, whether ideally it slows down the rate of, of brain loss, um, and then we can have some idea that the treatment's having a positive effect. So are we ready? Yes, we are. <laughs> Rachel Scarhill, thank you very much. And so to our second guest, uh, Steve, Steve Finkbeiner is the director of the Toby Corrett 
for Center for Huntington's Disease Research in San Francisco. Uh, he works on molecular mechanisms of neurodegeneration. That's to you and me how cells look after proteins. Now, Steve says he gets so engrossed in problems that he can be very absent-minded. And after a calculus time in college, he went to the pool uh, for a swim to blow off steam, but became so obsessed with one of the math problems that was still buzzing around his head, he forgot to put his swimsuit on <laughs> before he left the locker room. <laughs> He says the expression on the faces of the people that pool sobered him up very quickly. <laughs> so cold that day, was it, Steve? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Finkbein. Hi, Steve. Thanks for coming. So I saw your talk today, and you had a beautiful video. You built a robot microscope. So uh, every other investigator in this room has slave students that they use to do that. Why, why would you go to all the effort to build a robot microscope? It seems like an elaborate tool. Yeah, well, um, there are a couple reasons. One is that uh, it's, even if you have slave students, it works actually faster than they do. <laughs> um, but uh, another, another, um, another uh, issue is that, um, you know, I think one thing to keep in mind is that when you do science, it's, uh, it's sort of by people for people. And there are some uh, things about just being a person doing science that has some limitations. And that's one of the reasons we have those careful designs of clinical trials. It's basically to keep our own biases out of the results we get so that we can be sure that whatever we get out actually is pretty much the, the accurate truth. And so the way this robot works is we pretty much ask it to make the calls for us. And we look over its shoulder, but, uh, but it tells us the results. So you can use the technology to be more objective about Absolutely, what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And have, do you think that you've learned um, by using these more objective, blinded kind of techniques, things um, that perhaps you would have been biased against believing um, with, you know, if it hadn't been such an objective way of looking at it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I can think of, um, there's some events actually, first of all, that don't occur often enough so that if you're just one slave student looking at, you know, a few microscope fields, you may dismiss it as a one-time event that's of no consequence. But with this, you can look at a million cells and find out that 50,000, you know, exhibit that phenotype. And that's, oh, oh. Phenotype. Uh, almost let <laughs> that one by. <laughs> Rats. <laughs> yeah, so, so they exhibit a particular appearance uh, or difference. And so with, with this appearance, you're, you're tracking the actual movement of the Huntington um, protein, which I think by now we've all learned is the, what causes the disease within the cell. Um, so do you think that these things that you're learning will actually help um, inform therapeutics for patients? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah. is that uh, this is going to be a really powerful tool, uh, both for making uh, really important observations, but also uh, for really working through some ideas for therapy. So we're really hoping that um, this thing will give us an idea, a really uh, pretty clear idea of how the whole process works so that we can, in a really thoughtful way, go in and hit the thing that's going to make the biggest difference. That sounds great. Thanks very much, Steve. Let's have the video question, guys. We do have, we do have a video question from uh, your, your native California. Bursting through on the screen. Yes, please, please play it. Okay. Next slide. <laughs> Hello again, everybody in Melbourne. This is Gene Veritas, a.k.a. Ken Servan, the gene-positive Huntington's disease blogger in San Diego, California. Dr. Finkbeiner, you have found that the level of stress in the cell is a better predictor than the dose of mutant Huntington. Does this mean that in Huntington's disease, each human being, or maybe even each neuron, responds uniquely in combating the disease? Thank you, Dr. Finkbeiner and everybody for your efforts, and have a successful Congress. 
Okay, well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, so one of the things that we discovered with this technology is, uh, is that, uh, <laughs> uh, is that uh, we can measure the dose that each cell gets of Huntington, but we can also measure how well that cell deals with the Huntington protein. And it turns out uh, that actually how well each cell kind of can handle these proteins is a better predictor of how long it's going to live and how well it's going to do than the dose it gets. And so uh, we think that uh, the cells have really a powerful uh, adaptive coping responses that they can elicit uh, to try to deal with beaten Huntington. And uh, the better they do with that, the longer they live. So there does seem to be, from our work, evidence that uh, different neurons do have different capacities for responding to mutant Huntington and dealing with it. And so I think that was a real surprise to us because I think in years past when we tried to answer questions like this, we would do biochemistry, we would just grind everything up and then try to get the answer out. But with these approaches, you can look at individual cells and see differences that you wouldn't have missed the other way. Thank you, Steve. Paul Machowski is a professor at the Gladstone Institute of Neurological Disease in uh, California, worked on drug development to protect neurons. Paul also has a new line of research of particular interest to me, which he will probably touch on. I happen to know he's a very good golfer because he beat me. Well, actually, actually on consideration, that's not a very high bar, actually. He once toured through Europe playing timpani with a symphony, symphony, or symphony, symphony, symphony. <laughs> Interesting how many of these researchers are musicians as well, isn't it? Anyway, um, but most interestingly, Paul recently co-starred in a rap video about scientific gangsters called Today Was a Good Day, and yes, we can bring it to you, I think. <laughs> Creep to the pool, we're gonna get crunk. Don't wanna have to deal with the dumbass parts. Afternoon lounging, sipping on some beer. You know it's gonna be another bomb ass here. Then it was time to drop some knowledge. This is the kind of shit they don't teach it when you call us back some. <laughs> Maybe we should take a vote on whether people want to talk about the drugs <laughs> for Huntington's disease or the other thing. <laughs> okay, so um, to business. So you gave a talk today in which, if I um, uh, didn't misunderstand massively, you... Which you never do. Which would never happen. <laughs> You um, presented two, two completely different drugs that you've uh, been working on, which both uh, make Huntington's disease mice live longer and improve their symptoms. So um, that's a pretty impressive achievement. Let's talk about your drug, uh, JM6, which is an inhibitor of an enzyme, so it, it reduces the activity of a molecular machine called KMO. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, basically um, we developed this drug. Uh, I actually did it together with my dad, who was a chemist who had worked for uh, many, many years in drug development, and we convinced him to help us on this project. And um, there had been a lot of research out there suggesting that blocking this enzyme might be protective for Huntington's disease, and no one had ever done it. I was actually quite surprised no one had ever done it. And so you know, we worked together and made this drug, uh, put it in the mice and uh, saw some interesting beneficial effects of it, and so we've been following up on that. And one particularly interesting thing I think about it as well is that um, KMO seems to be important not just for Huntington's disease, so we tested uh, JM6 also in the mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, and it also improved some of the symptoms that those mice get, which I think in the long run, um, the more that we can find potential therapies that are also associated with more common diseases like that is going to be a good thing for Huntington's disease because it's going to bring in a lot more research and effort around the world towards Huntington's disease. Cool. So um, tell us about your other drug. So that's the KMO drug. Yeah. And the other drug targets cannabinoid receptors, which are the, if I'm not mistaken, the receptors, the uh, molecular signaling proteins 
which are also activated when you, people smoke cannabis. Yes, so um, the second uh, thing I was, uh, project I was talking about, um, as you mentioned, um, is a drug that mimics um, cannabis, essentially. However, it actually acts on um, a target that's only in immune cells and not in neurons. So um, people have studied um, the effects of cannabis for um, many, many years, and um, cannabis mediates um, you know, the euphoric effects of marijuana by hitting receptors in neurons called the CB1 receptor, and um, the drug that we're studying it's number two, CB2, which is only on the immune cells. And um, basically, um, we believe that this receptor, this protein, um, regulates a lot of important um, functions of immune cells that basically um, create crosstalk with the brain. And, and it might regulate some of the degeneration that goes on in the brain. And what was really interesting to me, Paul, was that the, both of these drugs are actually hitting targets outside the brain, but the <coughs> symptoms that are improving are, are certainly symptoms that are caused by problems within the brain. Yeah. And this seems to, to be opening up a new door where getting the drug into the brain, which is a, has always been a huge problem, it may not be the be all and end all, right? So affecting things in the blood or outside the brain can have effects within the brain because of changes that take place after the drug acts in the body, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So, um, to me, uh, from a, personally, I think this is probably one of the more interesting things that we found. Um, the immune system has long been suspected by a lot of researchers to potentially influence degeneration in the brain, like in diseases like Huntington's and Alzheimer's. Um, and we sort of forgot, I guess, as researchers, that there's always a crosstalk and communication going on between your brain and the periphery. And when I talked, I used the example of a fever. You get a bacterial infection, and right away your immune cells sense the bacteria. They send a signal up to the brain, and then the brain talks back to the immune cells to help resolve your infection. Well, um, so basically what we're thinking of it is hijacking your body's natural <coughs> communication lines to basically send signals up to the brain that can be neuroprotective. And I think um, there's probably going to be broad applicability of this. I mean, we just looked at a couple of examples, but um, I suspect that more and more people are going to see that there's actually a lot of important crosstalk between the brain and periphery that, that might be able to take advantage of for, for drug development. That sounds great. So we look forward to hearing about the next step, which will be trials of these drugs or drugs like them in here. Yes, uh, I hope so. Thank you, Paul, and uh, back to Charles. Thank you. Uh, I think, by my reckoning, that's only Paul who gets the um, great cover to Nobel Prize. I'll leave that to you guys and give it to him. Um, and, um, thank you to all of you in Chatland, of course, our guests, and uh, indeed, we bid farewell to our wonderful uh, doctors in the house. Uh, and it can be read every day of the year on hdbuzz.net. Ed Wilde and the wonderful Jeff Carroll. <laughs> now, someone who gave a talk here, not about a specific line of research today, but about a whole range of efforts to find treatments for HD, was Robert Pacifici. Robert's the Chief Scientific Organizer, uh, Officer of uh, CHDI, CHDI, the US-based not-for-profit organization. But he hasn't always looked like a corporate lawyer. Uh, Robert <laughs> used to follow the Grateful Dead. And in more than a hundred, that's them, and in more than 100 of their concerts, he went to, he experimented in other kinds of chemistry to those that he works in now. And I <laughs> would like to say, come on down, Robert. So, CHDI, biggest funder and driver of HD drug research in the, the world. Just how many treatments? And before I start this, you will get an opportunity to get your own prize here, Robert. You've got to answer all of these questions in less than a minute, okay? Then you get the prize. I've got it here. 
biggest funder of uh, drug research. How many treatments are there uh, in the pipeline of CHDI, and how, when are they going to begin? Well, you know, treatments is, uh, is a strong word. Um, obviously, CHDI does its best to cover soup to nuts within drug discovery. So there are efforts that are very early stage, blue sky discovery types of work. Uh, obviously, some of the um, uh, support of the observational trials that, that you heard about, um, and all the stuff that fits in between the two um, with the translational work. So um, if you uh, want a specific number, I would say like at any given moment, there are about 12 or so translational programs that are ongoing. And uh, these are all done collaboratively with, with our partners. In some cases, it's with uh, some of the presenters that you've seen at the conference, uh, ISIS Pharmaceuticals and, and, and others. And then there are um, certain programs that we're running internally um, with contract research organizations. And then uh, lastly, there are things that we've been able to do with large pharmaceutical companies where we've enticed them to take some of the compounds that they have um, developed perhaps for other indications and see whether or not we can test them within an HD context. So uh, on any given day, I think we've got about 12 shots on goal that we're doing our best to support and shepherd towards the planet. Very good, well done, very nice, very brief. HD Buzz reader uh, Laura Hudson from, from, from the UK uh, wants to ask you, how long does it normally take for drugs to go through clinical trials? Well, um, this is probably not the answer that people want to hear, but it's, it's incredibly variable. Um, so it really depends on the nature of the drug, where did it start, um, and how long is the clinical trial going, going to take. So uh, there are some industry benchmarks. I think uh, the, the thing that people point to is, uh, on average, uh, about 15 years uh, for development all, all the way through from research on, on through the, the clinical part of it, um, and somewhere around uh, a billion dollars. But obviously, sometimes you can get lucky, as is the case with uh, some of our interactions with the pharmaceutical companies where, for example, they had compounds that had already been through phase one trials. So they had already demonstrated the fact that they were safe and, and well tolerated, but had never been tested in HD as an indication. And so they jumpstart by entering in the pipeline at phase two or, or, or even phase three. Um, in general, what we do is, you know, we do our best to, to minimize those, those timelines. And I think more importantly, what we try and do is uh, maximize our chances for success. So, so there's a lot of things you can do, um, as I try to highlight in my talk before you get to the clinic, so that um, the sort of warts and pimples of, uh, of these compounds are worked out before they get to human testing. Louise Stewart from Australia asks you, are there any trials that people with the HD gene with no symptoms can participate in to help future generations? Absolutely. I mean, community involvement and, and engagement uh, is, has certainly been a big theme here at, at, at the Congress. Um, for those of you uh, who had the opportunity to hear about Enroll HD, I think that's the quintessential example. What we're looking to do is have you know, a comprehensive uh, catalog of all of the uh, folks that uh, we may need to tap into in, in, in the future, uh, not only for um, some of the uh, additional spin-out trials, but for some of the larger registration trials. So um, I think Enroll HD is, is a great example of how uh, everybody can get involved, um, whether they're symptomatic, whether they've been gene tested, or, or even whether they're, they're a family member that's interested in helping. Okay. And lastly, Dawn Bowie from Toronto wants to know, how important are collaborations in this field of drug, the drug discovery? Simply put, um, there's no way to discover a drug without collaboration. Uh, it is such a massive interdisciplinary effort where we need scientists from all different walks of life, medicinal chemistry, pharmacokinetics, biologists, uh, clinicians. And so it's, it's absolutely critical, not only within the science and, and medical domain, uh, but even to tap into, um, obviously, the, the patients and, and their caregivers. Um, one of the themes from my talk this morning is nothing being more precious than an observation that's, that's actually made in, in, in uh, affected individuals. Well, that observation may be something that the patient reports. It may be something that a caregiver uh, reports. It may be something that comes out of um, a, a clinical trial. So the collaboration and the ability for all the different folks to bring to bear uh, the very diverse set of, of skills and, and insights and capabilities um, is, is absolutely essential to discovering a drug, and it's one of the uh, beautiful things about the Huntington's community. Thank you very much indeed, Robert, and uh, always stay at that head, dude.
Thanks very much. Talk about that later. All right, now to tell us about things from Melbourne we should know about. More Australian than Skippy the Bush Kangaroo. If she was any more Australian, she'd fall off the end of the world. Mel Brinsmead. <laughs> So from the convention centre, I've been to kind of stuck for the last few days. This place, Melbourne, seemed a pretty quiet and peaceful place, isn't oh, it? Oh no, not at all, Charles. Not at all. You should check out. Throughout the 90s and the noughties, right, Melbourne was the scene of a gruesome gangland war. 36 knocked each other off. Pop down to the big market, get yourself an illegal copy. Probably only stick to series one. I've been hearing all about this exercise and cognitive stimulation business. However, the most recent underbelly bloke was knocked off by an exercise bike to the back of the head. Can you believe it? I think they took cognitive stimulation a little too literally. <laughs> okay, now there must be a more uh, pleasant and wholesome side of knowledge. Well, yes. In 1956, we hosted the Olympic Games. <clears throat> That's how we end up with the MCG, it was hosted there. Or as the G as we call it in Melbourne. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, I forgot another bit. <laughs> Speaking about the Olympics, next year, Australia's kind of kick butt. Sorry guys. <laughs> now you call it the G, I thought it was the, uh, the MCG. Do, do you short guys shorten everything? Like when we, we need our lesson tonight in how to speak Australian. Oh, we sure do shorten everything, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> I always love to shorten everything. Everything has a nickname. I'll give you a couple of examples. Bickies, biscuits. Chewy, chewy gum. Chockies, chocolate. Coldy, cold drink, or it's usually a beer in Melbourne, or Australia even. Doozy, something very significant or very large. And prezzy, present. So, Chuck, Chuckies make a doozy of a prezzy. <laughs> uh, okay, so now tell me tonight's version of um, Melbourneian exports, please, Mel. Well, perhaps the most famous of all comes from the suburbs of Mooney Ponds. Yeah. Damon Nurbridge yeah. possums. Yeah. And again, this one's for the Brits out there. The entire cast of Neighbours. While you're in town, make sure you get your tour of Ramsey Street. <laughs> and one more, please. Kath and Kim! <laughs> These two classy Sheilas are from the burbs of Fountain Lakes. Kath and Kim, look at my child, look at mine! <laughs> Check them out on YouTube, crack up. Well, apart from Kath and Kim, what else is on in Melbourne? Well, for those of you who aren't lucky enough to have a ticket tonight, head to Chinatown for some yum cha. Perhaps check out a movie. Good Aussie one at the moment is Red Dog. Apparently it's really Aussie. Or if music's more your scene and good food, head north to Fitzroy. And if you're into the arts, street art, if that's right up your alley, head to Hosier Lane and to Grave Street. That's where you can find all the really good graffiti. But there's not all just the big you know, rough stuff, there's a refined side. To <coughs> oh, well there is. Romeo and Juliet, they're showing at the Art Centre at the moment. And I have heard the Australian Ballet now searching for this year's Soldier for the Nutcracker. So, Chuck, if you're in town <laughs> a little long, plie down and audition. <laughs> oh, moving on, quickly. <laughs> Tonight, what are we wear, going to wear tonight, Mel? What's the weather? Oh, well, it's blowing a gale out there, Chuck. Blowing an absolute gale. So, girls, hold on to your dresses. It's a little 
warmer than last night though. We've got 11 tonight, so I'd, I'd probably still skip the linen suit and pop the um, Ugg boots on. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget your brolly. Melbourne has switched on the rain for tomorrow. Okay, so now, Mel, if we're headed to the dinner this evening, what do we do? All oh, right, so if you lot are out to the fancy dinner tonight, starts at seven, so I won't, I won't keep you too long. You can get there by cab or taxi, as we call them here. <coughs> the taxi rank is over the road, that way. <laughs> Crown Casino, you can get one there. Or I've been told it's a 20 minute walk. We don't do that here. <laughs> so yeah, if, if you're in heels, I suggest you get a cab. Well, I look forward to seeing you there. Can I say, Mom, thank you so much for all of your work over the last two nights. We, I feel more Australian than I could ever expect. <laughs> Australians is that they never do anything in excess. We don't always know the terms the scientists may say, but we treasure every word from them and praise the breakthrough they bring our way. So continue your wonderful programs as you help to spread the word. Again, a great big thank you, the loudest you've ever heard. And so Times Boomerang has circled the Yarra River and returned crashing through the walls of the Melbourne Conference Centre to tell us that we must end our reporting from the World Congress here in Melbourne. So all that is left for me is to thank my co-presenters, Drs. Ed Wilde, Jeff Carroll, and Melanie Grimsmead, the outstanding OzBuzz production team of Lee Young, Jeff McDonald, Chris Pershow, Ben Ryan, Alex Sensor, and Julie Stout, and of course everyone at the Melbourne Convention Centre, but most of all, the audience, here in Melbourne 
and around the world. I hope that we have succeeded in some way in our quest to move the world of communications between all the parts of the HD community into a global chapter. Because Huntington's disease does not recognize borders or territories, so nor should we. And on that note, I would like to leave you with the words of the astronaut John David Bartow describing Earth from the International Space Station. As I looked down, I saw a large river meandering slowly along for miles, passing from one country to another without stopping. I also saw huge forests extending along several borders, and I watched the extent of one ocean touch the shores of separate continents. Two words leapt to mind as I looked down on all this, commonality and interdependence. We are all one world. Good night.